We are just on time, so I have now the enormous pleasure to introduce N. Catherine Hales, who will be now presenting her keynote lecture. I have the great honor of uh, being able to say that Catherine Hales, who has been inspiring my work and uh, certainly all that has gone into this project from my side and I think from others as well, for many, many years, not only the, the honor of having her here, but of having her as collaborator in the project. Uh, for me, the work of uh, Catherine is deeply related to metabody in more than one sense. On the one hand, for me, it's, uh, it's a great embodiment of, of the meta as I envision it. The meta is uh, a cross, a movement across that is not defining a new fixed territory, but is always generating a productive and creative in between, even if starting from such fields as literature, studies and science, but generating irreducible, irreducible potential fields, although in the, in the process the critical posthumanism has been crucially defined by her. Um, notions around technogenesis and the posthuman, um, the whole critical revision of cybernetics and information as we proposed to frame it in this conference. All of this has, has emerged in that process without, however, letting that foreclose a new kind of specific singular field, at least that is my perception. And, Therefore, I feel multiple, multiple connections. Um, so, and uh, there's perhaps uh, in, in, an, in an online interview, I saw of yours once, I, I, I heard you say that, um, well, having been born in a countryside, in a rural area, that you had always appreciated the way in which things were were, uh, uh, afford, uh, were afforded in, in, when you walked across the countryside in ways that you, were, that you did not have to kind of, well, pay for them or... So I, I see there perhaps, perhaps it's just, well, uh, an, uh, a comment or a, how uh, perhaps that has a lot to do with uh, the fact that you, you have had such a long-standing interest in embodiment and also um, that you are, uh, that you sh have, uh, or that you frame that in a, what I perceive as an intrinsic generosity. So embodiment as gener and generosity is intrinsically connected to things that are not necessarily preempted in, in a grid. So with these few words, I would like to, to welcome Catherine in the conference, and so. I'd like to thank Jaime for that generous introduction and indeed for the invitation to be here today and to speak to you. Uh, so today I want to present some very new work and because it's new, I'm eager for your feedback and responses and critique of it. Um, so what I'm trying to describe today is what I see as a very significant shift in technological and cultural formations. And this shift consists essentially of two interrelated strands indicated in my subtitle. On the one hand, a growing awareness of the costs of consciousness, and on the other hand, 
a growing appreciation of the rise of non-cognitive cognition, non-conscious cognition. So on the one hand, the cost of consciousness. On the other hand, the um, uses and extensiveness of cognitive non-conscious. So let me begin to illustrate what we mean by cognitive non-conscious by referring to a work by Stanislaw Lim, Summa Technologia. This work was published in Polish in 1964. I think shortly thereafter it was translated into Czech and German, but there was no English translation available until this year. So as far as the Anglophone work world was concerned, it just kind of sunk into oblivion and never really influenced cybernetics and information theory the way that it potentially could have. One of the comments that Lem makes in Summa Technologia is um, to observe that what is now fully realized 50 years later, that at that time we were on the brink of an information uh, explosion that threatened to overwhelm civilizations. So he imagines a point of maximum saturation in which everyone on the planet is an information scientist. And he says at that point we have exhausted all human resources. There's no further resources to get if we are solely limited to human cognition. And the solution that he saw was to automate cognition. And he gives an example of how this could be done in something that he calls an information farm. So let's say you're trying to model a dynamic complex system. Lim suggests that first you need a diversity generator, so he suggests a fast running stream that is carrying down rocks of various sizes. Then you put a sieve or a barrier of some kind that selects from this stream rocks of only a certain size and velocity. Then you put other sieves that make other kinds of selections until finally you have uh, a model of the dynamic system that you're trying to understand. So if we take Lim's example, of how you might model cognition <clears throat> with a non-conscious system, we can make several observations about this relatively simple system that he proposed. <clears throat> First is that cognition is not located in the rocks, it's not located in the water, it's located in the system as a whole. Many people have critiqued Cyril's Chinese room on exactly this basis. So for those of you who may not be familiar with this thought experiment, John Searle proposed that we put a man in a room. Uh, he's completely isolated, but he's got a rule book there, and there's a slot in the door. And someone feeds squiggles through the slot in the door, which are actually Chinese characters. And the man has a rule book that tells him what characters he should associate with the squiggles that came in through the door. And he feeds the squiggles that he selected out through the door. So Searle posed this thought experiment to essentially argue computers can't think. And there's a trick in Searle's Chinese room. And the trick is that you've got a very powerful cognizer sitting in there, that is the man. But in this scenario, the man is not using any of his cognition. He's just matching up patterns and putting patterns back out. He doesn't read Chinese. He doesn't write Chinese. He has no idea of what it is that he is responding to or even what the question was. So the implication that Sarah wanted to draw was neither does a computer have any idea of what it's actually doing. But many people have pointed out that the cognitive system here is not the man. The cognitive system is the whole room. And that the whole room, including the man, is carrying out a sophisticated cognitive task. So this leads us now to redefine what a cognitive agent might be.
If I were just to throw out the phrase cognitive agent, your first association might be with a human brain. A human brain is certainly a cognitive agent. But here, cognitive agent takes on a specific and very different meaning that a cognitive agent, in this sense, is a participant in a constraint-driven in evolutionary complex adaptive system. This formulation has too many words in it because evolutionary already implies adaptive and adaptive already implies evolutionary. But I thought I'd just get all those words in there to make it clear what my point was. So notice that the agent is the participant in the system, but it's the system which is undertaking the cognition. Now, if we compare this to traditional ideas of thinking, it could not be more different that uh, the human brain is undoubtedly the result of a constraint-driven evolutionary complex adaptive system that is all of human and technological evolution, but it contains in itself the ability to think, whereas cognition in the way I'm using the term, is distinct from thinking. Thinking implies conceptualization, the use of symbolic languages, the use of formal systems, and so forth. Cognition implies the ability to model complex systems, which is different from um, thinking. In fact, thinking is very bad at modeling complex systems for reasons that I'll get to in a moment. And in a moment, I'll, I'll try to explain why this definition is constraint-driven rather than causally driven. Because with human cognition, we think first and last of causality. All right, if we're going to be talking about the difference between cognition and thinking, we have to have at least a rough pass at what consciousness is. And I say this with fear and trembling because uh, there is a huge ocean of commentary and research on consciousness. So my remarks here will be quite rudimentary and simple, just meant to sketch in some landmarks for us. Almost everyone who writes about consciousness um, realizes that you need at least two levels of consciousness, at least two. You might have 12, you might have 20, but you can't get by with less than two. So these two levels, as theorized by Antonio Damasio, for example, are called core consciousness, or Gerald Edelman, primary consciousness. Most people who write on consciousness agree that core consciousness is not uniquely human. It's shared at least by other primates, probably other mammals, maybe other animals as well. So what does core consciousness get you? It is able to conceptualize a self who is an actor in the world. It is able to conceptualize the self in relation to objects and create a relational matrix for them. Uh, so, for example, a leopard chasing a gazelle certainly has a sense of his capabilities. He certainly recognizes the prey. The prey has core consciousness as well, trying to escape the predator and so forth. So having core consciousness bestows enormous advantages on a species. That's probably why every predator species for certain, has core consciousness. Because, as Andy Clark observes, core consciousness is a weapon in the cognitive arms race. And species with core consciousness certainly have enormous advantages over species without core consciousness. But now that we need a second level as well, this second level we can call higher level consciousness. And higher level consciousness gets you the ability to locate the self in a context of action, the ability to reflect on the self as a self, the ability to create and manipulate symbols, the ability to create and use languages. And higher level consciousness, defined in this way, 
is, if not unique to humans, much more extensive and pervasively developed in humans than in any other species, which is essentially the argument that Terence Deacon is making in the symbolic species. I don't necessarily agree that only humans have these capabilities. I think it's been shown that at least some primates do as well. But without a doubt, they're much more developed in humans. So higher consciousness depends on and is built on core consciousness. If lesions in the brain disable higher consciousness, core consciousness is still able to function virtually intact. But if lesions in the brain disable core consciousness, higher consciousness is severely disabled. So if we think about where in the brain core consciousness is located, it goes from the brain stem up to the midbrain, whereas higher consciousness is located in the forefront of the brain, specifically the neocortex. This is important because it suggests, as we might expect, that core consciousness developed first in evolutionary terms, and then uh, the further development of the brain resulted in higher consciousness. So now let's get in a little further how consciousness actually works on a neural basis. And this is a highly controversial area to define the neural correlates for consciousness, that is, what is in the neural structures that generate consciousness. But one possibility has been put forth by Gerald Edelman in his theory of neural Darwinism. So Edelman proposes that neurons cluster together to form what he calls functional clusters, and that these functional clusters contribute to the contents of consciousness. Um, they connect with other functional cust clusters. And in this way, they begin to develop a topology, which is a neural correlate to consciousness. So these uh, neural structures exist in two forms in Edelman's scheme. Uh, they can be functional clusters. They can also be maps. He calls it neural Darwinism because his position is that the functional clusters which are able to interact efficiently with sensory stimuli flourish and grow. Those that do not react that efficiently dwindle and die. Hence, there's a kind of Darwinian principle of uh, fitness selection going on on a neural basis. So here we see one of Edelman's schemes. First, you've got the cell. Then you build maps. For example, the neuron clusters that maps what's happening on the back of the retina into the brain. Then scenes are built out of maps. Primary consciousness is built out of scenes. And then secondary consciousness is built out of primary consciousness. So now that we have just an elementary sketch here of what consciousness is, we can turn to consider the costs of consciousness. The idea that consciousness has costs really has only entered the scientific literature in this century or in the 20th century and the 21st. And uh, there's a whole list of the costs of consciousness. One is that Consciousness is energetically expensive, as one person put it. The brain is a glucose hog. In order to create core consciousness and higher level consciousness, a lot of biological and energetic resources have to be devoted to that. So of course the implication is there has to be some payoff that more than compensates for this cost. Consciousness is also slow relative to perception. So neurologists talk about the missing half second. That half second is the lapse between when sensory input enters the nervous system and when consciousness registers uh, that it's there. A lot happens in that half second. So consciousness is always belated. Consciousness is always behind the times. Consciousness is always interpreting something that has already happened. So in research done by Benjamin Lippitt, for example, he's demonstrated that if he asks a subject to raise her hand, 
and to say, articulate, I'm raising my hand now. Before that articulation can happen, the muscles already have begun the motion uh, that is intended. So consciousness doesn't even know its own intentions. It's always belated in terms of its own intentions. Now here's another cost of consciousness, uh, which is very relevant to this project and what I'm going to say later. And that is that there's a deep association between both core and higher level consciousness and the sense of that we are individuals. So as Tony DiMazio puts it, I would say that consciousness as currently designed, nice little a qualification there, maybe we don't know where evolution's going to take us, but as currently designed, constrains the world of imagination to be first and foremost about the individual, about an individual organism, about the self in the broadest sense of the term. So in other words, by having higher consciousness, we have a very strong bias to place the individual, particularly ourselves, at the center of the action. This is another cost of consciousness. But there's a further cost, and that is that consciousness is dedicated to maintaining coherence. As Edelman says, many neuropsychological disorders demonstrate that consciousness can bend or shrink, and at times even split, but it does not tolerate breaks in coherence. Now what this means, practically, on an everyday basis, is that consciousness constantly and pervasively confabulates. It confabulates to make the things, the input it is getting, make sense. So there are lots of illustrations of this um, in the um, uh, dysfunctional literature, for example, various kinds of agnosia, in one form of agnosia, a woman was blind. Her sensory appar visual apparatus did not operate, but consciously she was convinced that she was not blind. And the researchers could not convince her by reason that she was blind. When she ran into things trying to cross the room, well, it was just because she's always been clumsy. And no matter what explanations they presented her with, consciousness confabulated to maintain the coherence of its worldview that she was a sighted individual. But there are lots of examples of this. Um, it can work the other way as well. For example, in blind sight, someone is able to see, but the sensory input has not been integrated into core consciousness. So they get the sensory input, in that sense their visual apparatus is working fine, but a lesion in the brain or some other brain injury keeps them from processing that sensory input. Now the interesting thing about this is if you say to somebody who has this uh, blind sight, where is the candle right now? They'll say, well, I have no idea because they're not registering the sensory input. But if you force them and you say, well, just take a guess, you know, sometimes they'll resist. Well, I'm not the kind of person who guesses. But if you force them, they know where the candle is. They just can't conscious, consciously articulate. So someone who, who has blind sight can't see a ball, but you throw them a ball and they'll catch it because they know where the ball is. They know, but consciousness doesn't know. But there are lots of uh, examples of confabulation from just ordinary consciousness. I'll give you just a couple of quick examples. In one experiment, um, a researcher goes up to a person on the street and asks for directions. And in an arranged situation, two workmen carry a piece of plywood between them as the person's talking, temporarily blocking out the sight of the person who's asking for directions. So it starts out, a man is asking for directions. When the plywood passes, it's a woman. But about 80% of the subjects won't notice this, this 
gender shift that's taken place. Their consciousness confabulates, well, it has to be the same person I was talking to previously, therefore they just don't register that it's not only a different person, it's actually a different sex. And there are lots and lots of examples of this. Another one uh, has a basketball court and um, you're watching a video of this and the researcher asks you to count how many times the basketball bounces. And in the midst of the bounces, a gorilla walks through the scene. And then afterwards, they'll say, well, how many bounces did you count? And you know, the person will respond, it was 10 bounces. Did you see anything unusual? 80% of the people say, no. Oh, there was nothing unusual. They just screen out the sight of a gorilla walking through the scene because consciousness doesn't accept the fact that there would be a gorilla in the middle. Strengths are more powerful with complex adaptive system than causal reasoning is because you eliminate possibilities instead of trying to trace every causal trajectory in detail, which is impossible. Instead, you look at the system as a whole. Remember, it's the whole system that's the cognitive system. And then you impose a series of constraints to bring it into a more simplified form. So you see this in action with discursive explanations with Jared Diamond's books, for example, Germ Germs, Guns, and Steel. Diamond is asking huge questions of complex cultural ecological systems like uh, why, why are there only a few species that are used as livestock throughout the world? And to answer that, he doesn't use causal reasoning. He apply, applies constraints. So, you can't have carnivores as livestock because they would eat more meat than they would ever produce. So you throw out all the carnivores, now you're left with the herbivores. But some of the herbivores have really nasty dispositions like zebras, so you throw out those with nasty dispositions, throw out those which are inefficient food um, digesters and so forth, and find you're left with the five or six species that are commonly used as livestock. That's how an explanation by constraint works, as opposed to an explanation by causality. <clears throat> now, I really like uh, Mayasu's argument up to the last chapter. And with the last chapter, what he tries to do is to follow a line of thought set out by his mentor, Alain Badu, and turned to set theory. And uh, it gets here fairly technical fairly quickly, but I'll just say from my point of view that I've been developing here, this is a futile effort because we already know that formal systems are not very good at deal with complex adaptive phenomena. So why go back to set theory? But uh, Jan Romp, Rump Portal is making a presentation later this afternoon in which he'll suggest a formal language that can deal better with complexity. So I'll wait and hear what he has to say. All right, another example of speculative realism where we begin to see a new emphasis on non-conscious cognition. Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology and what Harmon tries to do is to conceptualize everything that exists in the universe as an object without any special privilege to human consciousness. So humans are objects, but this microphone is an object, the chairs are an object, everything is an object. And then he proposes, following Heidegger, that objects withdraw from all relationality that you can never really know what these inside and objects, so they're a little bit like Leibniz's monads in this respect. I have some serious uh, reservations about Harman's argument, especially when he makes the mind-boggling move of saying that relations are also objects. So now he's turned the entire universe into an ossified structure in which nothing dynamic can ever happen. But, uh, Quibbles aside, what he shares with Mayasu and what he shares with the emphasis on the cognitive non-conscious is a challenge to human exceptionalism. So cognition is no longer the exclusive province of humans. It's distributed across objects. And even human cognition has some serious limitations. <clears throat> 
Jane Bennett in Vibrant Matter is sort of um, following a similar line of thought and arguing that matter is lively, it's vibrant. Uh, she points out all the ways in which matter can carry out agential activities without human supervision or intervention. And she also makes the point that um, the, poor, the boundaries of the skin are much more porous. There's chemical interactions happening all the time. So finally, you can't even draw a firm boundary between the human and the non-human. We could go on in this vein. We could mention Bruno Latour's actor network theory, Bill Brown's thing theory, and so forth. What all these have in common is an attempt to open the field of cognition beyond the human and to flatten the human so it kind of exists on the same ontological scale as other, other things. Now, I'm not wedded to this idea, and I look forward to your feedback to telling me it really stinks. That's fine. Please be honest. You won't hurt my feelings. But it could be handy to have a single word to signify this whole complex of thoughts. It's kind of unwieldy to say every time, the cost of consciousness and the rise of cognitive non-conscious, what if we could just have one word that refer to it? So kind of playing off the idea of the enlightenment, I have a suggestion of the gloaming. The gloaming is a somewhat archaic word, which in English means twilight, not dark, but twilight. It's derived from an old English word, glow on, which means to glow. So it contrasts with the Enlightenment. We talk about the Enlightenment immediately, the very word evokes rationality, evokes light, evokes visuality, the ability to see. Twilight dampens down visual acuity. Twilight is not in the full light of consciousness. Consciousness hasn't disappeared, so it's not darkness, but other forces are asserting themselves, namely the cognitive non-conscious. So let me know what you think. Does the gloaming grab you or not? And now I'll conclude by just mentioning a couple of literary works uh, that begin to show how this idea of the cognitive non-conscious and the costs of consciousness are being expressed in popular literature. So Greg, Greg Egan is an Australian science fiction writer. To my mind, he is one of the most interesting conceptual writers we have at present. And I'm particularly intrigued by two books that he published seven years apart. First is called Quarantine, and the second is called Terranesia. Quarantine's premise is this, that a certain day several decades into the 22nd century, a black sphere suddenly appears out of nowhere and begins enclosing our solar system, cutting Earth not off from the sun, which would of course kill everything on Earth, cutting Earth off from the stars. Now it's clear that some alien intelligence has created this black sphere. It's clear that it's an artifact. No one knows why. No one knows who created it. No one knows what its purpose is. But it's called Bubble Day, and it marks a, um, a huge uh, rupture in human history. So post Double Day, technology is now developed to the point where most people have neural mods. That is, they have hardware implanted in their brain that gives them additional neural capacities or limits their neural capacities. We're not so far from that at present, although we don't have it in the advanced form that Egan imagines. <clears throat> so our protagonist has a neural mod implanted in his brain that begins to function not quite in the way it was intended. And what the neural mod begins to do is to open up for our protagonist quantum possibilities that we normally experience only in collapsed form. So we won't go too far into quantum mechanics except to say that quantum mechanics generates a range of possibilities and at the point of observation those possibilities are collapsed into a single world line. 
Nobody quite knows what causes the collapse. Common explanation is it's somehow the act of observation itself which causes the wave function to collapse. But let us suppose that you could, as a conscious being, operate in a world in which the quantum possibilities were not collapsed. So let's say that you're trying to pick a very sophisticated lock that has 10 billion possibilities. If you could occupy simultaneously all those quantum states, you could generate 10 billion cells. Each cell would try out one combination, and then you selectively pick the one self that has the correct combination. You then collapse the waveform the wave function, and now the timeline that continues into the future is the timeline in which you're able to pick out that lock. So what this ability would open up is the fantastic capability to try out many, many, many possibilities all at once, consciously, selectively choose the one that works. There now is in development, I think, Kevin alluded to this, quantum computers, quantum computers operate on the same principle. They exploit multiple quantum states, so essentially they all become parallel processors because they're operated in the uncollapsed uh, quantum wave function. So <clears throat> in quarantine, it turns out that um, the ability to keep all of these quantum possibilities open and selectively collapse them um, corresponds to the action of consciousness with its interaction with the quantum world. This is not a new idea. John, Voiman, John von Neumann suggested that consciousness was what collapsed the waveform. But what's that relationship to the black sphere? Well, at the end of the novel, spoiler alert, it. Uh, it turns out that the human species is the only species in the universe which has developed consciousness and which has the ability to collapse the waveforms. For every other intelligent species in the universe, they operate continuously in an uncollapsed state. So at first it was okay because it was just the Earth, but then as Earth began to expand its sensory range through telescopes and so forth, they began collapsing waveforms further and further into space, and now they were threatening the very lives of all the species that don't collapse the waveforms, so they were quarantined. They were quarantined by having the black sphere enclose the solar system. But the same people who in developed the neural mod now have made it into an aerosol virus. The aerosol virus is released, and suddenly all of Australia now begins to function like the rest of the universe, where incredible things can happen. One in 10 billion chances that this could happen, like a daisy could grow up in the middle of the sidewalk instantaneously, but that's possible. It's just never realized in the real world because it's so phenomenally, statistically impossible. But now the statistically impossible happens everywhere and induces, as you might imagine, social chaos. In fact, it sounds an awful lot like Mayasu's Great Outdoors. Any possibility can be realized at any moment you don't need a causal chain because now you're operating with all of these quantum possibilities. So what would you say about this? Well, you could say this is the worst example of techno-humanism where we're using technology in ways that have all kinds of unintended consequences. You can also look at it that this is a destruction of the self. Because when you generate 10 billion selves, what is the real self? You become much more aware that the, the self is a fiction. But even more devastating, what you realize is that the human race is an anomaly. It's an anomaly in the whole universe. All of the rest of the universe is operating according to very different principles. They're operating in Mayasu's great outdoors. In Terranesia, Egan explores the same kind of idea, the idea that you could have uncollapsed wave uh, functions, but now the agent exploiting these uncollapsed wave functions is evolution itself. Now you get a 
cognitive non-conscious force, the force of evolution, which is exploiting the quantum possibilities to greatly accelerate the rate of mutation, and now it can pick the one possibility out of billions that's adaptive. So suddenly species starting in the uh, Pacific Ocean on a small island and then radiating outward begin to mutate like crazy, and all of the mutations are advantageous and adaptive. Well, now it's just a matter of time before it extends to the human species and the human species begins mutating in very unexpected ways as well. So this time I won't spoil the ending for you. Uh, instead I'll go on to Peter Watts's book, Blind Sight. Clearly he's been reading Metzinger and other people on consciousness. And uh, in Blind Sight, on a certain day in the not too far future, 60 billion objects encompass the Earth and take the Earth's picture at a resolution of one meter. They all explode at once, like 10 billion can can cameras all going off. Why? Well, clearly these are alien artifacts. People on Earth are scared silly. Anybody who has this technology is going to be a pretty formidable foe. So they send out a spaceship with a crew of five people to encounter and discover these aliens, which they do in far, far space beyond the solar system. And when they discover the alien species, their first thought, they capture one of them, dissect it, that this is a species as dumb as a stick because it has no genes, it appears not to have a neocortex. It has only kind of brainstem functions. But nevertheless, this species has an incredibly advanced technology. And what they slowly come to realize is that this is a species which has never developed consciousness. So all of its actions are non-conscious. But despite this, it has a technology which dwarfs and over overwhelms Earth's technology. So Peter Watts is sort of asking the question, if we grant that the cognitive non-conscious can have this kind of efficacy, would it be possible to have a non-conscious species which nevertheless could develop extremely powerful high technologies? And his answer to that question is yes. So the book ends with uh, only one of the crew surviving, going back in the shuttle to Earth to report on this alien species, but the crew member thinks that very likely the aliens will get to Earth first, and he sort of meditates on his long journey that he may be the last sentient creature in the universe. So this is the way that popular fiction is sort of thinking about these ideas, beginning to uh, try to show in represent representational forms the uh, limitations, the cost of consciousness, and the power of the cognitive non-conscious. So with that, I'll conclude. I know Jaime and I have a conversation scheduled, but I hope there will be some time before or after that that we can invite questions and responses from you as well. Thank you very much. So let's open now some time for immediate questions, and then we will have, hmm. uh, and then we have uh, the dialogue with uh, between me and uh, Catherine, which will give again a new round of uh, a time for a new round of comments and questions. Fascinating talk. I was, I was thinking as you were talking uh, about the uh, the idea of the cognitive unconscious. Um, if I understand what you were saying properly, uh, it's sort of a scaffolding upon which 
uh, the, the consciousness is built, and, and it operates underneath and behind the scenes. Um, the types of cognitive unconscious that you present as examples um, brings up the question for me of how to deal with intentionality. Um, where does it fit in there in the idea of the cognitive unconscious? For instance, in, in blind sight, um, somebody can't intentionally reach for that candle unless someone forces them and causes a sort of reflexive action that, that affects the cognitive unconscious. So, so how, does that, how does intentionality fit in there? Is that a clear question? How does intentionality fit in? Yeah, and how would it operate? Yeah, so let's say that we accept Metzen, Metzinger's argument and we agree there is no self. Well, we all associate our own agency with ourself. We have agency because we have a self. So what does that imply about agency if we have no self? We have only these dynamic processes constantly in motion. Well, I think what it implies is not an individual sense of agency, but a systemic sense of agency. So in the same way that a complex system as a whole is what's operating as a cognitive agent, the whole system now becomes the source of agency. And that agency, as we know, can be conflictual. So, you know, Freud long ago posited that the unconscious was in at least partial conflict with the consciousness and had its own way of dealing with those conflicts. So now we have a sort of model of distributed conflictual agency in which you would need some sort of consensus in order to be able to act at all. But it suggests that action need not necessarily be endorsed on all levels of agency. You know, like you force yourself, let's say you're a soldier, to go into combat. Well, there have to be many, many parts of that cognitive system which you're saying, whoa, whoa, we're not going there. That's crazy. You know, and it takes a lot of conditioning in order to be able to force people to carry out those kinds of actions. So we get a much more complex sense of agency. It's not the agency of a unitary self. It's the conflicted, distributed agency of an entire system. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, speaking of the system, this is, sounds weird, but anyway, um, I just wanted to bring up uh, Hubel and Wiesel's experiments. Um, I don't know if you know about them, but you probably came across them. Uh, these are two neuroscientists um, who did um, tons of experiments on cats and mostly kittens uh, to study the development of uh, visual perception. And um, what they did was they would um, take a newborn kitten and put it in a room um, which only had uh, horizontal lines. So the kitten, as it's growing up, uh, would not be exposed to anything that has any verticality to it. And um, after a certain time, when they take out the kitten, which is now a cat, the cat would not be able to distinguish between uh, the vertical uh, elements in the world versus the horizontal elements in the world. I just thought that this could be maybe um, an example of this, like the consciousness in the system, because in the kitten's um, world, the kitten, let's think of the kitten as the agent who cannot uh, perceive uh, horizontality, uh, sorry, verticality. Horizontality is the missing uh, consciousness in the environment. Maybe you'll send me that reference, Bernard. Yeah, it sounds I will. really relevant. Thanks. I will. Yeah, but I think you make an interesting point there, too, which is that um, consciousness and non consciousness depend on a rich environment that supports and extends cognition. And if we could imagine a non conscious intelligent species, they would have to have a highly engineered, high, you would displace, as it were, part of the sentience into the environment instead of into the species. And that's the case in Peter Watt's novel, Blindsight. 
Yeah, Harmony. <clears throat> Thank you. This is kind of an undeveloped question, but I'm wondering about the, I, the idea of um, cognitive non-consciousness or, or intelligence that is non-conscious. And I'm, I'm trying to think of other practices, um, well-developed practices that exhibit a tendency toward this idea. So like meditation um, or, or artistic practices that involve a, a kind of um, bracketing of evaluation, of judgment, of interpretation uh, to kind of suspend oneself in that moment of creation or whatever. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are other models that don't come from a, a kind of techno-scientific domain that could speak to the same idea and I don't know what it would say to, to this, the more kind of uh, evolutionary or techno-scientific model of, of cognitive non-consciousness, um, but I'm just curious, you know, as, as one looks for models of this phenomenon, yeah, where so else is it? Yeah, so Metziger recognizes in a sentence that many of his ideas could be found in Zen Buddhism and meditative practices. He doesn't want to go that way because it's, quote, unscientific. But it sort of leads to the same conclusions, you know, that you focus on the processes, breathing, for example, and more and more you get in tune with the breathing and the process, the less and less real the self seems to you. And finally, you get to the point where you realize that the self is an illusion. And so it leads to very much the same kind of conclusion, except it's an embodied practice, not a conceptual theory. And you could also point to any kind of athletic or dance activities where the delay involved in consciousness is fatal. You can't wait that missing half second. And so any athlete knows that the worst thing you can do is to let your conscious mind rule your game when you're in the midst of an intense competitive um, uh, game, for example. You have to react much faster than that missing half second. So you only call in consciousness intermittently. And you know, there's lots of stories um, there's an anecdote, someone asked a centipede, how do you know how to raise your 89th leg? And the centipede had started thinking about it and thereafter was not able to move at all and starve to death. So, you know, somebody who uh, is asked to verbalize how they know how to ride a bicycle and suddenly they're not able to ride a bicycle. So lots of experiments like that, kindergartners, shown how to make a fan, you know, the way we all made them as kids, can do it effortlessly and immediately. But even after they've had that experience, if they're given discursive constructions on how to make a fan, they then become unable to make a fan. So there's lots of examples of where consciousness actually interferes with what we might call muscle memory, embodied memory, embodied performance, and so forth. Um, okay, thank you, Catherine, for this in incredible talk. Um, I, I think it has just uh, turned some of the things I've thought so far on their head. And I, I, I think, it, according to your model, it seems to me that definitely it, 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 we, we, we don't need consciousness to have a technology. And, or at least, if it's possible for the cognitive unconscious to develop a technology, then developing a technology doesn't make consciousness emerge, which is a very interesting way of, of seeing things. And I just wondered, I just wanted to, quest, to ask, what kind of technology, how is it possible to develop a technology, and what kind of technology is it um, that develops at the level of a cognitive unconscious? And also, does the cognitive unconscious have a sense of time or that doesn't apply at all at that level? So um, that's sort of the $64,000 question. How could you develop a sophisticated technology without consciousness since all of our procedures involve at least extended period of not only consciousness, but higher consciousness to conceptualize the problem, carry it out, and so forth. 
But there's lots of instances of non-conscious species who do very sophisticated things because of the natural constraints of the material. So an example is uh, honeybees. So honeybees build uh, honeycombs. How do they know how to build honeycombs? They have tiny little minds. They probably don't have core consciousness, certainly don't have higher consciousness. Well, it's because of the constraints material. Each bee stands at a certain point, chews wax, and puts down the wax in a circular pattern, but other bees are doing the same thing at the time, and the hexagonal form emerges because of the constraints of the material that the bees are carrying out. So it then turns out to be a hexagonal pattern, which is also the closest packing thing. So there's lots of examples of that. Termite columns would be another example, where because they're working with natural materials, we don't think about this as technology per se, but they are technologies, and they're technologies which are emerging not from consciousness, but from working with the materials along set patterns where the constraints built into the materials create much more complex structures. So, you know, Peter Watts is really straining the limits of his imagination into figuring out how this would work if you weren't building honeycombs, but you were building lasers, for example. But uh, I think that sort of suggests a possible opening, and one could perhaps carry it on from there. So maybe it's time for us to...